Icebreakers podcast episode one. Bing, bing, bing. Welcome to the Icebreakers podcast. I'm Matt Evers. And I'm Frankie Seaman. Hello, you beautiful people. Thank you for joining us. I am so excited about this, Frankie, because this is the first time that we have ever had or been able to have a platform to be able to do something like this. I mean, we can reach the fans, we can bring all the gossip, all the little bits that don't make the show. It's so exciting. And I'm so glad we're doing it together. Absolutely. We haven't skated together in quite a few years. So it's nice to be back together with my little skating elf. You're my favorite partner. I say that to everyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> First and foremost, Happy New Year to all of you listening, but also Frankie, how was your New Year's? Oh, it was great. We had all the family around. It was amazing. You know, bubbles, fun times. Yours? Um, it was pretty chill. I gotta say, the older I get, the less I do. Were you in California? I was in California. California, yay! And apologies to all of you listening. Um, there is a, what is it? A post? It's a bit ironic, actually. What are they called? A talking post box. It's, there's a talking post box about five meters behind us because we are at the Chiltern View Ice Rink recording these first couple of podcasts. So we have to give them a big thank you anyway. And it's beautiful here. Look, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's so festive. If you guys get a chance to come skating here, there's a rink back there. It's huge. It, we're in a live environment. Anything could happen. I mean, it's a bit like doing Dancing on Ice on a Sunday night. Once they hit that record button, there's no whole bars. But no, I was saying it's a bit ironic because Masked Dancer, you and your husband, weren't you? pillar and post. We were pillar and post. I mean, it's no big secret. The secret's out of the bag. I was dressed like a sexy post box, actually. And he was dressed like a eh, not so sexy big package. <laughs> How appropriate. How appropriate for a man that's like six foot four. Size, I'm not a size queen. Size doesn't matter, but I'm just saying he's six foot four, okay? <laughs> and all in proportion. But what size are his shoes? I mean, that would be telling. <laughs> actually, he's not really in proportion. If he was, he'd be 10 foot tall. Oh my God. Wow. Back to the Icebreakers podcast. What we are going to be trying to achieve week after week after week is really break down what we see on Dancing on Ice each week. And I think what's great about it is you and I have a unique perspective having competed in the show, but also as professional ice skaters. And before that, before we became professional ice skaters, we were amateur ice skaters. So we have competed, we have done shows, we have performed, and we've also taught celebs how to skate. For you, how many years did you do? 10 years almost, nine years, 10 years. I, I, um, I did, I think, nine series, and then I did the, also the Going for Gold series yeah. with Colin Jackson when he made his first Dancing on Ice appearance. Yes. I taught him how to skate. He taught me how to hurdle. If you're not familiar with Dancing on Ice, I did every series up until this year. So that was 15 or 16 series, plus a series in Australia too. My goodness, how old are you? I'm, yeah, I'm double the age of what I was when I started Dancing on Ice, let's just say that. That's crazy. <laughs> I think I am too, no, I'm not. <laughs> oh my God, well, you look amazing. All right, well, with Dancing on Ice starting in a couple of weeks, I thought so it would exciting. be- I oh, know, series you know 16. What? You're gonna be so missed though. I have to say, because obviously I've been retired now for many <clears throat> years, mm. and I have to say welcome to retirement. I know it's probably not where you wanted to be. I don't know. How do you feel about watching it now as a fan? Well, we'll get into this in future podcasts for sure. Uh, but at the same token too, I'm kind of enjoying it. For the first time since I was nine years old, have I actually taken some time off? I've allowed my body to rest. I actually feel in better shape now than I was during the series, which doesn't seem like it should be that way. That's a really interesting thing because I think as a pro athlete, you're so tight your whole life. And actually, as you get older, that becomes more and more apparent. And I know that when I first retired, that unwinding and that relaxing of those muscles and those fibers felt really good. The, the, the hard part has been not having anything to do. Yeah. And I mean, I still have things to do, but at the same token too, it's there's these moments of like, oh, I don't have to look forward to that contract that's going to start when you meet your celebrity the end of October, early November. So that was a little bit of a tricky time for me mentally um, when I saw on social media all of the other pros getting their celebrities and the celebs training and all of that. Like it's been. It's been tricky, but I have to say hats off to you. You've been an incredible friend through all of this as well. I've got a great support system. Just there's only a couple of you, um, but you kind of were the glue that kept me together through those months. So thank you. I mean, I think I have been through it, but I know how it is as a professional ice skater and you've been skating since you were teeny tiny, as have I, it defines you. 
Hi, I'm Matt Evers. I'm a professional ice skater. Yeah. And when you're not anymore, it's a real soul, like a hole in your soul. It really kind of jars you because now, well, what am I? Where is my place in the world? Yeah, absolutely. I think too, and as professional athletes, we go through numerous retirements through our career. You know, you possibly it, when you're in your teens or early 20s, you retire from a competitive sport. And then you, you know, choose to go into a different career or stay in skating as I did and you did. And then you then retire again from your professional career. And it's like, now I'm in my 40s, what the hell do I do? Oh, no, 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 no. Let's cut that bit out. No, well, now you're in your 24s. Yeah. <laughs> I started dancing nice when I was six. I mean, I, I had two professional retirements. I retired before I joined Dancing on Ice at the age of 30. And then I came back and had this amazing swan song. So I think, you know, if the one positive thing you can take from it is how long a career you've had. We're professional athletes. Professional athletes don't get to work until they're in their 40s. Yeah. Again, like I said, we'll get into this in a future podcast, but there is so much that Dancing on Ice taught me about my life and who I am as a human being that I am now really starting to explore. So it is, it's, it's exciting at the same token too. Yeah, it's a bit of a Debbie Downer, but you know, the support that I've had from the fans of the show has just been incredible, absolutely incredible. I think what's fascinating about Dancing on Ice, and perhaps people at home don't realize this, is before we became professionals on that show, we had this whole career where we just performed all over the world in different shows, and it was an amazingly glamorous lifestyle. But when you come to Dancing on Ice, all of a sudden, you're a coach, and you have to teach somebody all that knowledge that you have inside you, and you may not be equipped to do that. That's a whole other skill. Absolutely. And I remember my first partner, and I had to hit the ground running. I was like, well, actually, how do I do that? You know, like breaking that down in your body. And actually, I think that teaches you a lot about yourself, about how much patience you have, about how you can understand and empathize with somebody else that's going through this really difficult thing. And people can think, oh, it's just ice skating. How hard can it be? It's fun. It is fun, of course. But it's really hard work. I mean, I found that each and every one of my partners at some point in the show had a bit of a breakdown, you know, had a little bit of a like, I can't do this anymore, I need a day off. Yeah, 100%. And it is every single person that you teach that we are given by the production to teach them how to ice skate has completely different languages. Yeah. They all speak English, but everybody, and I've always said this, it was kind of a secret to my success with the show was, I had to be a chameleon, I had to learn how as fast as I could, how to get into that person's head and into their body about how it moves and how we can facilitate ourselves on the ice. And their spatial awareness. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, these celebs don't have any of that. I know. <laughs> you know, and like series one with Bonnie Langford, she, uh, she I mean, was a she, dancer. She's a dream. But she couldn't skate. Like yeah. I had to work with her so hard to understand what the body was doing on the ice because it's so different to what it is on the dance floor or like on a wood floor for and, her dancing. And the reason for that is because dancers, if you don't know at home, is because dancers really stand up tall in their bodies and ice skaters, we're more like rugby players. Like we uh, squat really low into our knees. We have to get our weight down into the ice, pushing down into the ice at all times so we don't fall. A lot of people at home don't understand. They think that ice skating and dancing is the same thing. Yeah, from the upper body up maybe. Yeah. But what's going on down below is completely different. That's and right. I know that having done Mass Dancer because I was terrible. <laughs> no, you, you weren't. You guys were great. But, but I had to learn that. And, and Aaron, our choreographer, and Haley kept saying to me, what's wrong with your feet? And I was like, what do you mean? They're doing like what I normally do because they look like club feet because I had skates on them. Yeah. So we've had 15 amazing, incredible, spectacular, breathtaking series of Dancing on Ice. Let's review each and every one of them. Let's do the best bit. That'll be about a four hour long <laughs> podcast. I think the fans at home would like that. <laughs> true, true. But no, I think we should do, yeah, the most memorable moments. And I think what most people watch Dancing on Ice for is the fear factor. The 100%. Spills, right? So in your opinion, best fall? Oh, I mean, they've been so, I had a few myself. Okay, Likewise. we won't talk about that. Likewise. <laughs> I mean, I do remember getting dropped on my head at one point and just not knowing what was happening. Um, you've had some spectacular ones. Let me think, let me, Gemma, Gemma Collins, what year was yeah, that? That was just uh, three or four, four years ago now, I think. No way. Yeah. Um, it was that huge. Was, that was a moment. That was one of those moments in my life, not a pinch me moment, but one of these slap me across the face and wake <laughs> me up as fast as possible. First off, it wasn't set up. The oh. number one comment that people have from that fall is, oh my God, that was, the, she did it on purpose. Really? 
People you, say that? Yeah. You, you do not fall like that on purpose. No, she I could mean, have really hurt herself. Really hurt herself. And she did. I mean, she came in the next day and her, her bust was black and blue because as she fell, she didn't really stop herself. She hit her toe pick, uh, which is, you know, the teeth at the front of the blades. Oh, they are vicious. When she went down, I actually thought she hit her face. Yeah, so did I. I watched it on TV and I was like, <gasps> yeah. You can see her kind of slide. And at that point I was like, she's going to hit the header, yeah. which is like the, the edge of the rink. Yeah. So I then try and get in front of her to prevent her from smashing uh, into smashing that, smashing her face into that. And she just laid there and I went, oh my God, is she all right? Is she all right? And then she sat up and she kind of giggled a little bit. She was dazed. And I just went, we need to, we, Gemma, if you're okay, stand up. We need to try and get to the end of this routine. And she got up and she said she was all right. And then she looked at the camera and then she waved. <laughs> <laughs> checked out. She just checked out. And I was like, we, we have to try and finish this. There was still like 10, 15 seconds left of the music, right? It was one of the probably highlights for me in regards to exposure for the show because that clip of her falling went global. Viral, I, I mean, know. And it's still, it still pops up. Did they make a meme out of it? They need to Oh yeah, I mean, it was, it was a meme within like minutes, like literally. <laughs> but I think for me, if I'm not gonna obviously include myself in one of these moments. <laughs> but <laughs> it was a great a lot. one. <laughs> Todd Carty. Todd Carty, 2009, he didn't fall. He wiped, he almost flew actually. He wiped out <laughs> like a freight train. It was a total wipeout. And I was sitting at the side of the rink because in those days we used to sit next to the rink yeah. after you had skated. And I was sitting on the bench and I knew it was coming up that he was supposed to go down the tunnel. That bit was choreographed, yeah. fine. And Susie, our great friend Susie, lipping over, sent him down the tunnel on his way. And behind there, the people at home don't know, there's a cameraman a stage, um, a stage manager and somebody, a grip who holds all the cables together and Todd <laughs> managed to wipe all three of them out. <laughs> and it some of them weren't even on the ice. They weren't even on the ice and it was <laughs> carnage. <laughs> and all I heard was clatter, 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 splat, nothing, silence. And we were like, oh, for a split second. And then out he came. And I, I know Nick, who was stage manager at the time, just managed to kind of grab him by his shoulders and set him back on his feet and they pushed, pushed him, him. Out, they yeah. pushed him out. I was backstage because I think we were next to skate or maybe one behind that. And I just remember because there used to be a monitor backstage that we could watch, right? <laughs> yeah. And obviously so the monitor- a TV screen on a stand. Yeah, literally he skates out of the shot because he skated back through the tunnel and all I heard was just all this commotion. <laughs> like there, nobody said a sound. There wasn't, he didn't scream, he didn't peep, he didn't do anything. There was no grunt. <laughs> It was literally just silence and just all these like pitter patters and skate sounds. And I remember looking to my left being like, what the hell has just happened? And next thing you know, like you said, Nick picks him up and pushes him back out there. And Susie was like, where, what happened? And his little face, his eyes were like a deer in headlights. No, his eyes were like the headlights actually. <laughs> so that clip itself, um, I can remember the press office telling me that was one of the first ever videos to go viral on YouTube. I mean, millions within minutes. <laughs> I, so I, I think we can all agree that Todd Carter wins best fall ever, ever. Best fall Not ever. even just on Dancing on Ice, but just ever. Ever, ever in life, ever in the history of the world. What are, you're like, planning something. Uh, no, no, I'm not. But this one's a big one. I was just thinking, we've done fall, so we really need to talk about best injury. Oh, oh my gosh, there's been so many of them. I mean, what broken about... Broken bones, yeah. sprained ankles. I don't think we've ever had a broken arm or anything. Yeah, we did. What about Michael Underwood? Oh, yeah. And he, Michael Underwood was our understudy, and then he, became, he came on the show, and then he was skating around, and he hit some tracks, wasn't there some like film? There was, yes, there was, there the was dolly some, track of the, the camera. Track, that's the word, yeah, the dolly track. He wiped out, broke his arm. That's right. And was out of the show. I don't think he'd, he'd even been in the show by this point. No, but he did come back. The following year. The following year. They gave him a second chance. And then there was. But then I think he got hurt again. <laughs> oh no, poor Michael. There's and been so many celebrities. He's such a lovely guy. What about um, Keith Chegwin? I think he broke his ribs. He broke his hip. Hip. Yes, oh. again, in one of those early rehearsal days. I mean, personally, I have had so many injuries on that show. I've had a concussion, a dislocated wrist. I mean, a mil oh, I broke a rib. What about you? Touch wood, I have been very, very, very lucky. I mean, other than the slice to your face. Well, the slice to my face, Georgie Porter, Evanescence, bring me back to life. How, why, why do I seem to be in all of these categories? <laughs> bring me back to life? Yeah, you needed that. <laughs> that happened on a dress rehearsal. First time you wear your costume, you're never quite sure what's gonna happen. Um, 
And they always tell us to be safe, you know, but sometimes you have to try the tricks because by the time we get to that Saturday dress rehearsal, that is the last time you're going to get to skate that routine before we go live. And sometimes it's like 10 o'clock at night. Like you're yeah. tired, they're tired, the crew are tired. Everybody wants to just get it done and get home. And it was the last run through. Um, everything had worked fine up until that point. We were doing the next spin, basically where Georgie kind of crawls up and puts her ankles behind my neck. You mean her ankles with feet, with blades on them? Yes, with skates you? on. And spinning around at the same time. Oh, and just to make it a little extra hard? Just, yeah. As she went upside down, the dress covered her face. You teach them to look up at you, so you always have eye contact. She couldn't see at that point, so as she stepped through, she misfired her foot, and it hit me right between the eyes. Oh, I'll never forget that. I think I must have been watching from the green room because I was watching your rehearsal, and it was on the monitor, so I mean, it was big. You know, your face was big, everything was big. <laughs> <laughs> I have a big face anyway. It was huge, and there was just blood. I mean, it was just pouring. You know, there's no, you were skating, so your heart was beating really yeah. fast, obviously, because you were exercising. So your blood was pumping, uh, there's no fat there anyway, and it was gushing, gushing, pouring. I yeah. mean, I didn't even know if it was your eye, your nose, like I was And the funny thing is, is, I don't remember any of it. I'm not surprised. I remember waking up, well, I didn't, I didn't black out because there's footage of me actually with a bandage skating off the ice, but I, I kind of came to when I was sat in the physio room with the medics. The hard part for that was the next 12 hours later having to perform live, not for me, I can do that routine, the most of these routines with my eyes closed, but I had a patch across my face and it, I was more concerned about Georgie. Of course, like psychologically, what is she going through thinking, I've just literally sliced his face open. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. She could have lost an eye. Yeah. And now what's she thinking? I don't want to do this again. Of course she is. She doesn't, she doesn't want to feel that responsibility. And you can totally understand that as a, as a male partner. You know how you would feel if, the same th if you had done the same thing to her. Yeah. That's what's hard about Dancing on Ice is that it is, there is so much psychology that goes behind it. Yes, you still are teaching somebody technical elements, but then you also have to get them to that live show every Sunday and get them through it as well. Uh, and what I always found extraordinary is because ice skating is so graceful, it looks kind of easy. And I always found it extraordinary that when I would meet my partners, they'd already had maybe a few weeks or a few hours of ice skating lessons with a with a coach, an actual coach at, an, at their local rink. And then you meet them and already the penny's starting to drop and they're like, I didn't think it would be this hard. Mm. And because it's a very solitary experience, you know, you don't see what everybody else is doing. You don't see that you're all in the same boat and actually you aren't. Sometimes people are really good or, or have a natural affinity for, for ice skating and some people don't. And I think that's when it hits them. They're like, I'm never ever going to be able to do this because it's really, really hard. And I think anyone that's ever been, you know, you, you understand immediately, like, I'm scared. It is a very dangerous sport and people forget it. I think that's why the show was orig originally so popular. Oh, um, uh, are you trying to say that people were just watching it for the full? 100%. <laughs> I do. We cannot forget to mention, though, Jennifer Ellison when she scorpion kicked herself with Daniel. Oh, that was that was vicious. It was incredible. Yeah, she she did have the most amazingly flexible back and legs. She was dance trained and she was almost like a contortionist. Her leg came up the back like this. And I think the adrenaline, she just overdid it. And she whacked herself in the head. Dunk. Like at the tip top of her head. Amazing. With her blade. What a diva, I love it. <laughs> the drama. There's been so many controversial things that have happened on Dancing and Ice. Do you not, think? Not just with the celebs. Right. But when the judges get involved, and then when sometimes the audience gets involved. Chef's kiss. I love this stuff. Okay, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're leading up to. The old Tim Healy storming the stage. Literally getting in Jason Gardner's face. Once again, Denise was your partner. So you're in the heart of this. I think I just, I'm, am I the drama? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you're like a little cyclone and you drag it all in. Do you know what I have to say? Okay. Tim Healy, slightly inebriated, not gonna lie. Um, but at that moment, as he came stomping down from the bleachers towards the judges, he was angry, right? And he was like a little bit wobbly. And we're all like, oh, what's he gonna do? It was jaws on the floors. And we're all thinking, oh my God, is he gonna hit him? Is he gonna like storm out? What's yeah. he gonna do? But I tell you what, in that moment, Tim Healy became the accidental hero of the nation. Not because he went and confronted Jason Gardner, which we all wanted to do, but because Every woman at home or watching that, I don't know about, about men, but every woman was thinking, oh, I wish my husband would like 
back me like that. I wish right. my husband would go and like stand up for me like that. He was such a little hero. I think I fell a little bit in love with Tim Healy. If you haven't seen the clip or if you didn't watch that series or that episode as well. Classic. What happened was is after Denise and I skated, we went up to Philip and Holly and we did the kiss and cry thing and they interview you and then they go to the judges and get your critique. What did he say? He said, Matt, it looks like you're skating with your mother. <gasps> And my, re my rebuttal to that instantaneously was, well, my mother passed away when I was 17. Oh, cool. I would give anything to skate with my mom, so thank you for that. It then spiraled out of control, and that's when Tim then stood up and stormed the stage. The words that were coming out of Jason's mouth, you could tell that he was just gripping for the last straw. But I have to say, although Tim Healy is definitely 100% the hero of this piece, to be put on the spot like that, it must have been a little bit intimidating for Jason. And he did come back with the mother of all clapbacks. And he was like, oh my God, your breath smells like an ashtray. Oh, right. <laughs> it was comedy. It was TV gold. Yeah. I mean, hopefully they made friends after that. Let's swiftly move on. <laughs> Let's swiftly move on. We can't review all 15 series without talking about the best skate. There were some amazing skates. I mean, it really has been. Oh, there's some, do you know there have been some beautiful moments? Yeah. And I think one that really stands out for me more than any, I, I think has to be Ray Quinn. You know, he mm. he was a ballroom dancer, so he had this incredible presence on the ice. He was only what, 20, 21, he was fearless, you know, he was young, he was fearless, athletic. Uh, and of course he had this incredible partnership with Maria. And I mean, God love Maria. She is an amazing choreographer, as we yeah. know, a brilliant skater. I don't think that could have been any better of a pairing. And some of their dancers, actually, we were moved to tears, some of them. I remember the dance that he did um, to get into the or, uh, in the final before the Bolero. And literally we were all stood there with our mouths aghast because we just couldn't believe the choreography that they had come up with between them uh, and the beauty and the ease with which he had taken to the ice and embraced the sport. And then not only in the original series of his, he then went on to the Champion of Champions show, which was series nine, and then won the Champion of Champions. The stuff that Ray came up with, again, working with Maria, um, choreographically speaking, was brilliant. I mean, stuff that some of us pros were envious of. But then, you know, taking a celebrity, teaching them how to ice skate, regardless if they had dance training or not, he was able to execute a Russian split jump which there are pros out there that can't do a Russian Absolutely. split Absolutely, and I mean, he didn't just do it, he did it like incredibly well. So congratulations, Ray Quinn. I mean, I think that is well a deserved. moment that uh, nobody will ever forget. But speaking of best skates, let's give a lady some credit. I think for me, the best ever female performance was Haley Tamadin's Jai Ho. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it was, it was really great. I think the thing with, with Haley, and obviously she's Persian, so she, they wanted to go back to the, to the sort of Persian roots, although it was an Indian dance, obviously, but I think they were trying to encapsulate that. Yeah. And actually, we have a Persian skater on the show this year, don't yes. we? Yes, yeah, which we'll get into next no. week. Top secret stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, comparing Ray to Haley, it's like comparing apples to oranges. Two totally different sort of disciplines. I, I mean, Haley was also trained, dance trained. She's also been to theater school. Yeah. But I do know that they did bring a choreographer, an outside choreographer in to do Haley's dance, which I loved. I mean, it was... Did they? I didn't even know that. Yeah, they had um, a, a Bollywood dancer come in, or Bollywood trained dancer, or choreographer, I should say, that came in and choreographed that. So, oh, right. Yeah, so I, I mean, I did love it. I mean, it was a, a real showstopper. I think there's there are moments within that Jai Ho piece that you can tell they were just so in sync. Yeah. Right? And I, you know, I we both were in that competition against Haley. That's true. And there were there were moments in it that I was like, wow, that was actually really good. Was I've it, got goosebumps thinking about it. Was it technically as good as Ray's? If you're gonna speak skating terms, no. Because there was a lot of toe work. Yeah. And what I mean by that is there were a lot of moves that were done stationary standing on the toe pits. Which you could have done on the floor. Which you can do on the floor. Whereas a lot of Ray's technical elements had fluid, had mo movement toward, uh, with it. So. Yeah, he was fast as well. He skated fast. I think Haley, you can't compare her. She's not as good a skater as Ray, but did she encapsulate the joy of dancing on ice? One, 100%. One million percent. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, think, I think we'll agree to disagree on that one. I'm, I'm team Ray on that one, but I do. I have to say, yeah, I've got goosebumps thinking about Haley. Well, from the best skates, male and female, to the king and queen of the ice, Torval and Dean, we cannot obviously forget about them. They are the brainchild of what dancing and ice is. They are the figureheads. 
Oh, they're national treasures. Bring national them on. Treasures, 100%. Worldwide treasures, really. I mean, yeah. you know, as even as an American. For me, I think they've done so many incredible performances. I really took a lot of time thinking about the answer to this one because, I mean, everything they do is incredible. And still to this day, right? They're in their 60s now and they're still doing things that. I could only hope to be doing when I'm oh, 60. They are amazing. They're an inspiration to all of us. And actually, they're the reason why I started skating back in 1984 when they won uh, the Olympics. I had literally just started to skate because of, of the run up to that, because there was like this fever gripping our nation uh, about, you know, this young couple that were going to the Olympics and that were encapsulating, you know, the, the passion that they brought on the ice and this love story that they had. So uh, for me, they've kind of uh, interwoven my whole life story. Mm, that's amazing, that's beautiful. Yeah. I think their best performance for me was um, when we did the opening group number to Sweet Dreams by oh. Annie Lennox. What? Like, we what? were all hidden under the fog and in these crazy costumes and it was, I mean, I still to this day have these pinch me moments when I think about what we all did with them. I just remember us doing this whole thing where we were all kind of in sync with the music and we were bobbing from side to side. And you're right, we were under the ice and Maria and I were, fate, were head to head. Um, and we were in this plank because we didn't want our bellies to touch the ice. It was so cold. Well, you guys were like in next to nothing too. We, and we were laying on the ice basically, but we were like in this plank because we thought, well, if we, if we go in a plank, we can keep our bellies off the ice and not have wet costumes. <laughs> uh, and they were just like trying to get the ice to, the dry ice to sort of cover us so that you couldn't see anybody and then you had to pop up and she and I were holding that plank for dear life and you know what it was the best time of my life I don't even care that I was holding a plank on freezing cold ice with wet elbows because that number for was like so, four takes for like four hours because that number was so great yeah it really was we'll do it again it was so artistic the, some of the some of the tricks the moves the maneuvers that Torval and Dean invent and have come up with over the years I mean they're just mind-boggling oh the concepts are amazing we can't talk about Torval and Dean without talking about the bolero that just mysticism on the ice yeah. that beautiful storytelling you know we had the 30 year anniversary and that routine I mean, we brought extra skaters in. That was a larger than life I routine. think there was like 70 skaters on the I ice at so, that point. Yeah. And we had those giant costumes and we had, you know, we had the incredible choreography from Kim Gavin. Um, it was, a sh that was a show stopping piece. It really um, was. It's a, it's a historic piece. And if you think about it, this year, 2024, this year is the 40 year anniversary. What are they gonna do to top that? I don't know, but I'm glad we have front row seats this year. I can't breathe. <laughs> it's gonna be, it'll be spectacular. You know it well. Well, we've got everybody covered at home because we are going to be reviewing that show as well. So I cannot wait to have the big 4-0 birthday party for the Bolero. Oh, yay, Torval and Dean. Congratulations, guys. Go on, girl. This one's for you guys. We love you. Well, we want to get you guys at home involved, by all means. Please go to our socials, which we're going to list in just a second. But we want to know what were your favorite skates, who were your favorite celebrities. Drop us a comment. We want to get you guys involved every single week. So we are going to be diving into the socials and all of the comments on the podcast as well. Frankie, where can they find us? OK, I have this. Facebook, YouTube and TikTok are all at Icebreakers Pod. Uh, Instagram is slightly different. It's at ice.breakers.pod. Or send us an email at officialicebreakerspod at gmail.com. Now, next week, I am so excited because we are going to be breaking down and revealing the cast of 2024. <laughs> Individually, we're going to go through who they are, what they do, our predictions. I mean, I, I have thoughts. I have opinions on this. So, yeah. Do you? Yeah, of course I do. Bring it on. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm, I do. I'm serving it up to you then, girl. <laughs> oh, I'm going to hear it. Thank you for joining us. First ever episode of Icebreakers, the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to sit alongside with you again. And thanks to the Chilton View Ice Rink, because without them, we wouldn't be in this beautiful festive environment. Absolutely. We can only apologize for the screaming children in the background. <laughs> Maybe the, the clanking of skates, the clicking of all of their fasteners. I'm just pleased nobody fell over. Oh, yeah. No injuries, touch wood so far here at the Chilton View Ice Rink. But thank you again for joining us, and we'll talk to you guys next week. See you next week. Icebreakers Pod is produced by Mint Media.